Welcome to the Faith Lift Radio Podcast, where doubt is destroyed and your faith is lifted. Here's today's message from Dr. Glenn. All right, people, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the Word of God. Spirit of God, I'm asking today that you will think through my mind and that you will speak through my lips. Thank you for these, your wonderful people that got ears to hear, mind to understand, and heart to receive the Word of the living God in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Now, let's go back to our foundational text, which was Psalm 72. Psalm 72 and verse 12. Psalm 72 and verse 12. And today, as we come to the end of the year and we're about to start a new year, we want to start it right. Of course, in the in the month of January, we will be fasting, glory to God, and praying. So this is why we're talking to you about the secrets of intercession. So Psalm 72 and verse 12, the Bible tells us, uh, For he shall deliver the needy, he will deliver the needy, when he crieth, when he crieth, Amen. So it's up to the needy, to the one in need, to cry out to God. The poor also, and him that has no helper, that has no helper. We know that one of the titles of the Holy Spirit is the helper. The Holy Spirit is our helper. So we can see that one of the help of the Holy Spirit is that he helps us to pray. Now, like I said to you yesterday, and I want to reiterate this, John Wesley said this many, many years ago, God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. God does nothing uh, except in response to believing prayer. In another quote, he says, it seems that God will not do anything in the earth unless his people praise, unless his people pray. Can you say amen? Praise God. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And yesterday we were talking about that one of the greatest secrets to getting things done in the earth is through what is known as intercession. Yesterday I gave you about seven points, seven or eight points on intercession. And today I'm going to give you again uh, seven or eight points on intercession. We're talking about the secrets of intercession. We defined to you what intercession was yesterday and so forth and so on. All right. We discovered if there's no voice, there'll be no victory. No voice, no victory. And if there's no voice, there is no path and no preparation for the Lord to bring victory into your life. John the Baptist, uh, uh, the, uh, we were told in Luke chapter 11 that the disciple approached Jesus and said, uh, that disciple said, Lord, teach us to pray even as John taught his disciples to pray. All right? And when John was asked the question, who are you? He said, I am a voice preparing the way for the Lord to make to make the crooked path straight. All right? So, so no voice equals no path and no preparation, amen, for the Lord, amen, to bring victory into your life. Okie dokie. Now, let's open our biblicals, please, to the book of Psalms 109. Psalms 109 and then Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. All right, we've got a lot of scriptures to to run through today, and I'm going to give you, let's see, seven or eight points of the secrets of intercession. The secrets of intercession. All right, Psalms 109, and look at verse 4. Psalms 109, and look at verse 4. David says, For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. Did you hear that? I give myself unto prayer. Why don't you make a decision and a dedication to give yourself in the year ahead of you that you will give yourself to prayer? Now, the New Testament rendition of this is found in Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. So Psalms 109 and verse 4, For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. Put your hand in your heart and say with me, I give myself unto prayer. Acts in chapter 6 and verse 4 tells us, uh, but we, this is what the disciple says, the apostle said, we will give ourselves continually. And the word here is 
continually. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Notice that. So Psalms 109 verse 4, the equivalent of it is Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. Incidentally, Psalms 109 and verse 4, the Passion Translation, I love it, I love it, I love it. All right, I want to read to you from the Passion Translation. Though I love them, they stand accusing me like Satan for what I've never done. They stand accusing me like Satan. The King James uses the word, engages the word adversaries. But the Passion Translation goes like this. Though I love them, they stand accusing me like Satan for what I've never done. Then it says this, where it says, I give myself unto prayer in the King James. The Passion Translation goes like this. I will pray until I become prayer itself. My, my, my. I will pray whoop, whoop, until I become prayer itself. Come on, put your hand on your heart and say this with me. I will pray until I become prayer itself. Can you say it again? Come on now. Uh, Psalms 109 and verse 4, the Passion Translation. Though I love them, they stand accusing me like Satan, for what I have never done, I will pray until I become prayer itself. I will pray. Come on, put your hand in your heart. Put your hand in your heart and say with me, I will pray until I become prayer itself. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the place where you want to be. You pray until you become prayer itself. That is what it means to have a strong prayer life, to become prayer itself. Ain't that good? Praise God. Now, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. <coughs> 1 Timothy chapter 2, before, before I give you the seven to eight secrets today. I told you we've got a number of scriptures to look at. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exalt, this is Paul speaking. And he's about to give you four categories of prayers, all right, four levels, four types of prayers. I exalt, therefore, that first of all, supplications, which is the Greek word deesis, which means your personal needs, all right, that first of all, supplications, deesis, uh, prayers, that's your relational prayers, intercessions, glory to God, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, he's talking to a pastor. He's talking to the church. He says, I exalt, therefore, that first of all, these are the four categories of prayer, supplication, your own personal needs, prayers, that's your relational prayers, glory to God, intercessions, and giving of thanks, four types of prayers, be made for all men, for kings, or for presidents, or for prime ministers, and for all that are in authority. Why do we have to have intercession and prayers? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. Are you listening? So the peace in your country is linked to uh, the church praying, interceding for the president, for the country. All right? <clears throat> that we may lead a quiet and peaceable, uh, the word quiet means an undisturbed and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. How many men? All men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, circle the word mediator and then circle the word intercession. And put a line between intercession and between the word mediator. Because that is what intercession is. It is to mediate. It is to mediate. All right? Now, so that's Paul's desire for the church. Now, so every church ought to be in intercessory prayer. Every pastor ought to be in intercessory prayer. Every evangelist ought to be in intercessory prayer for people to be saved. Are you listening? Whatever form of ministry that you're in, whatever church that you're in, Whatever, as a believer, you have to be part of 
intercession. Can you say amen? All right. Now, look at Isaiah 59, Isaiah 59, verse 16 till verse 19. We touched a bit on that yesterday, but I'm going to give you something else today. Isaiah 59, verse 16, talking about the Lord. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor, that there was no intercessor. This is the an indictment that has been going on from generations to generations. No intercessor because the sheep have this attitude leave it to the professionals and the professional the pastors do not have much of a prayer life so consequently because we have this leave it to the to the professionals attitude and then we have pastors and preachers who do not pray so no prayer no intercession is going on so he says and he wondered that there was no intercessor God forbid that that should be our reality. Now, look what it says here. And he wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. Now, look at verse 17. You tell me what does this sound like, and you write it in the margin. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. What does that sound like to you? Does anybody have any recollection of what that sounds like to us? Sir? Can you can you write down to, for me what does that sound like? What does it sound like to you? Where would you find this uh, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness? Where would you find this in the Bible? Where would you find this? All right. Thank you, Ms. Bonnie. In Ephesians chapter 6, talking about the armor of God. Talking about the armor of God. So that's why it's called the armor of God, because Jesus used it. All right. So look at, look at this now. And so the armor of God, it is your intercessory garment. All right, that's what the Bible tells you. You put on the you put on the helmet, you put on the breastplate, you put on, you pick, you pick up the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. Your loins gun about with truth, and we know that the loins got to do with your mind. All right, that the shoes of the gospel of peace. Glory be to God. Why? To pray, to pray. Now look what is called here. Look what is called here. Verse 17, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. So write this down, please. Uh, the armor of God is called the garments of vengeance. The armor of God is the intercessor's garment. It is the garment of intercession. Are you listening? Can you say amen? All right, so I want you to write this down. So it's called the garments of vengeance for clothing. And he was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries or to his accusers or recompense to his enemies. To the islands, he will repay or recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory and his what glory from the rising of the sun. Now, what I want you to do is where it says there was no intercessor, circle the word intercessor and glory from the rising of the sun, put the word uh, uh, circle the words glory from the rising of the sun and then put a line. That is what intercessors bring to the table. That is what intercessions bring to the table. Glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall rise up, shall lift up a standard against him. So I want you to write this down as well. Circle the word the Spirit of the Lord, okay, so put the word, circle the word intercessor, and put a line between intercessor and the glory from the rising of the sun, and then intercessor and the Spirit of the Lord lifting up a standard. That is what intercession does. I have not even given you the secrets yet, but this is good enough for you right now. But look at the words, there was no intercessor, and that is an indictment today that is still going on. Ezekiel chapter 22, 
Ezekiel chapter 22. We're going to look at verse 29. Verse 29 till verse 31. All right. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 29. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and the needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. The country was in sin. The country was in rebellion. The country was in idolatry. The country was in corruption, pretty much like most of the nations of the world. Pretty much like what we are experiencing right now in America. Pretty much what we're experiencing right now in Europe. Pretty much what, what you're experiencing right now in France, in England, in Mauritius, in South Africa. South Africa is even more, even more visible, all right, as it is visible in America. Are you listening to me now? We, we, listen, we are being governed by ungodly people. We are being governed and run by people who do not believe in the absolutes of God's word. And you see it all over the world. We call that which is evil good, and we call that which is good evil. Are you listening to me now? All right? If, even if you look at Mauritius, uh, a tiny little island, if you look at other little ni- islands and nations, it's corru- rampant corruption. It's rife. Rife. Are you listening? Just like in America, just like in Central America, just like, you know, people used to think that, oh, America is so, it's corrupt. It's corrupt. Okay? Are you listening? <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's, let's, let's keep on reading. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and the needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Look at verse 30. But I sought for a man. And I sought for one man. Remember, there was no intercessor. And I sought for one man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. But I what? I found none. And you connect that with Isaiah 59, verse 16. There was no intercessor. Therefore... Because no one interceded, no one stood in the gap, no one prayed. Therefore, I poured out my indignation. I poured out my indignation. Intercessors will result, or intercession will result in the pouring out of the glory. Pouring out of the Spirit. No intercession will result in the pouring out of indignation. And I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompense upon their head, saith the Lord. Okay, now, let's give you today Eight Secrets of Intercession, Part 2. And I hope you got your pen and paper, and I hope you're ready. I'm going to try to go as quick as I can, because I've got to do a mentorship uh, program right after this. Write this down, please. (coughs) Write this down, number one. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Write it down. Say, I am ready. Say, I'm ready to rock. Amen. I am ready. Glory to God. Write this down, please. Number one today. Intercession is the highest level of prayer. What? Intercession is the highest level of prayer. Why? For it is what Jesus is doing right now and what the Holy Ghost does. Let me say it again. Intercession. Everybody say with me. Intercession is the highest level of prayer. For it is what Jesus, our great high priest, our mediator, our redeemer, our savior, Amen, is doing right now and what the Holy Ghost does, what the Holy Spirit does. 
This is what I said to you yesterday. That intercession is the highest form of the prayer of agreement because it is the intercessory prayers of our heavenly intercessor connecting with our earthly intercessor. If these two shall agree, and they do, it shall be done. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession. What's Christ doing right now at the right hand of the Father? At the right hand of God? He is making intercession. Making intercession for us. Hebrews chapter <clears throat> 7 and verse 25, talking about the Lord, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The type of prayer that Jesus is engaging right now is intercession. First John chapter 2 and verse 1. First John chapter 2 and verse 1, please. All right. So you've got Romans 8, 34, Hebrews 7, 25, 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate. We have a parakletos and an intercessor, a counselor, a helper with the Father, Jesus the righteous. And he is the propitiation. He is the appeasement for our sins. Intercession, appeasement. Intercession, appeasement. All right? Not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So we see here that Jesus is at the right hand making intercession. Romans 8.26. Romans 8.26, ladies and gentlemen. Verse 26 uh, Till verse 27, likewise, the Spirit, who's that talking about? The Holy Spirit helps our also, helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray. How does he help you in your prayers? We, should, we, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. The help comes in the prayer. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession. Look at the word, maketh intercession. Maketh intercession. We've seen that, all right, <clears throat> three times now, and you're going to see it four times. He maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, and he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Glory to God. Amen. Because he maketh intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. So, this is why intercession is the highest level of prayer, for it is what Jesus is doing right now and what the Holy Ghost does through us. Can you say amen? And look at the word, maketh intercession. I want you to write this down. Maketh intercession is the Greek word, huperen tungano. All right? It's the Greek word, huperen, H-U-P-E-R-E-N, tungano, T-U-G, K A N double O, Huperentungano, O T U G A N double O. And the word Huperentungano literally means it's a bullseye. It's a dartboard, okay, with a bullseye. Are you listening? So when Jesus is praying, he's hitting the bullseye. And when the Holy Ghost is praying through you, now if you don't open your mouth and pray in the Holy Ghost, you're not going to hit any bullseye. Are you listening? But the Holy Ghost prays through you. You're both hitting the bullseye and you get the exact goal. Can you say amen? So, secret number one, intercession is the highest level of prayer for it is what Jesus is doing right now at the right hand of the Father and what the Holy Ghost does. Number two, number two, write this down. Secret number two today. True intercession is birthed through or born out of the fullness of God's word in you. Are you listening? True intercession is born out, all right, birth 
through the fullness of God's word in you. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 11, and I'm going to show you where the modern church is missing it. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books, right? Books, the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. So what is he doing? He is reading, meditating upon the book of Jeremiah, the prophecies of the weeping prophet Jeremiah, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And I set my face. I set my face. That is what intercession is. It is to set your face unto the Lord God to seek, to seek, to seek what you see in the word. What you see in the word, but you do not see manifestation in life, then you go to seek for it. You seek for it in intercession. To seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. Is not talking about the confession of the word. See, see, that's what we all know. All right. That's what we all know. He said, and I prayed unto the Lord, my God, and made my confession. And I said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and them that keep his commandments, we have sinned. We have sinned. So this is a confession of sins. All right. This is repentance. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly, and have rebelled even by departing from thy, from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion. Confusion of faces as of this day to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near, and that are afar off, uh, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face. Second time we see that. To our kings, and to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord, our God, belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Look at the word rebel, rebellion. Neither have we obeyed disobedience to the voice of our, the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants to prophets. Yea, all of Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. Can you see that? So, intercession has to do with the confession of sins as well. Repentance, 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 repentance. Are you listening? So, this is why we said to you that true intercession is born out of the fullness of God's word in you. It is born out of True intercession is born out of the fullness of God's word in you. And when you see the word, you will see the dynamics of what's missing, what caused it. Repentance come into place and then confessing of God's word. Are you listening? All right. So that's why you've got to be full of the word. Go to a church that teaches you the word, not telling you stories. Are you listening? Let's go to secret number three. Oh, I love secret number three. All right, secret number three, glory to God, intercession. Write this down, please. Intercession is what causes a divine shift in the spirit realm. It is what causes a divine shift in the atmosphere to bring revival. Revival is not hard, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, you know, you see a lot of modern church doing a lot of modern things uh, to bring in people. Listen, wherever the, wherever the cloud is, the crowd will gather. Wherever the glory is, the people will come. 
So intercession is what causes a divine shift in the spirit realm. It is what causes a divine shift in the atmosphere to bring revival. Are you listening? Isaiah, Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62. We're going to read verse 1. And then we're going to read verse 6 and 7. For Zion's sake, we know that Zion is a church. I will, not, will I not hold my peace? And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. I will not rest. Until the righteousness thereof go forth as the brightness and the salvation thereof as the lamp that burneth. Look at verse 6. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never, which shall never, which shall never. Do we have some watchmen in the house that will never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. Keep not silence. I remember the first time I read this verse. I was in Accra, Ghana. And I read that. And I was staying in this room that had two beds. <laughs> I was reading on my, my Bible on one bed. And I read this. <clears throat> Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. And give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Do not give God any rest until he establishes you, until there's a divine shift, until there is a divine shift in the atmosphere. So intercession is what causes a divine shift in the spirit realm. It's what caused a divine shift in the atmosphere and is what bring establishment in your life. There cannot be a divine establishment if there is not, first of all, a divine shift. Can you say amen? You want to see a shift in the atmosphere? You want to see a shift in your family? You want to see a shift in your finances? Glory be to God. Then give God no rest. Glory to God. You want to see a shift in your sons and your daughters. Glory to God. Maybe then they, they grew up in church. Maybe they know about church, but they're not living according to what you've taught them and to grow up. Well, that's because the devil is on their case and they are living in the most dangerous generation ever. Did you hear that? Your children are living in the most dangerous generation, the most corrupt, the most ribald, the most uh, evil, overtly evil generation ever. Remember what, remember what Paul says, in the last days, perilous times shall arise. Why? For men shall be lovers of themselves. And we're living in this generation right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you listening? So that's why you have to you have to pray. So give him no rest. Don't give rot. This is God's invitation to you. When I read that in Accra, I threw my Bible on the other Bible, uh, on the other bed and said, God, if that verse is true, then you are in trouble with me. I'm not going to shut up until I see a shift. I'm not going to shut up until I see an establishment. So intercessory prayer, the secret number three, is what Bring a shift will bring a sh will bring a shift and establishments in your life, in your family's life, in your church life, in your ministry, and so forth and so on. Number four, ladies and gentlemen, secret number four of intercession. Remember, we said to you, number one, intercession, right, is the highest <clears throat> level of prayer. For it is what Jesus is doing right now and what the Holy Spirit does. Secret number two, true intercession is born out of the fullness of God's word in you. Secret number three, intercession is what causes a divine shift 
in the spirit realm is it is what causes a divine shift in the atmosphere that brings revival and establishment secret number four secret of intercession number four intercession listen is winning the strategic battle with words intercession is battle remember we read in <clears throat> isaiah chapter let's go to isaiah please chapter 59 verse 16 and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor all right verse 17 he, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. That's the armor of God of Ephesians chapter 6. And he put on the garments of vengeance. The armor of God is the garment of vengeance. So intercession is winning the strategic battle with words. With what? Words. I want you to write this down and don't forget this. In earthly warfare, the weapons that are engaged are guns and bombs, stealth fighters, planes, choppers, knives. You've seen rainbow knife and so forth and, and, and so on. But in the realm of the spirit, ladies and gentlemen, in the spirit world, we do not use bombs and stealth fighters. No, our weapons, the most Powerful weapon are words. And by words, I mean your prayers. The most potent weapons in the spirit world, in spiritual warfare, are words. And by words, I mean prayers. What is spiritual warfare? I want you to write this down and don't forget it. We're still, on, we're still on secret number four. Spiritual warfare is the war of words. The war of words. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Are you listening? He is upholding all things by the word of his power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So spiritual warfare is the war of words. Are you listening to me now? Say that with me, please. Spiritual warfare is the war of words. Now, David had a war of words before he, before he slew Goliath. Before David killed Goliath with his sword, he slew him with his words. As a matter of fact, you will know this, that David had a war of words with his brothers. Remember that? We know your naughty heart. He had a war of words with the king and his elders. You, you, you're just a kid, man. You're just a kid. And this guy's a man of war from his youth. They didn't believe him. So he had a war of words with his brothers, a war of words with the king and his elders. Then he had a war of words with Goliath. Goliath came and disdained him. Am I a dog? Let you come with me with stick and, and stones? This day I will feed your carcass to the birds of the air. Uh -uh. See, what did David do then? He began to fight back with words. That is what intercession is. Say that with me, please. Come on, say with me. Intercessory prayer is a war of words. It's a battle of words. That's secret number four. And that's why Jesus is called the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. He has the first word and he has the last word. He who, he who binds first, remember I talked to you about the strong man, he who binds first will always have the last word. Can you say Amen. It's a war of words. Intercession is a war. It is winning the strategic battle with words. It is a war of words. If you do not understand the power of words 
and prayer, when I mean words, I mean talking about prayers, you will not be very strong in intercession. Are you listening? Okay, which brings me to point number five. Why is it a battle of words? Secret number five. Are you ready? Write this down, please. Are you ready? The battle of words, born out of the word of God, Okay, intercession, ladies and gentlemen, is what empowers angels, recruit other angels, and strengthens angels to win the battle in the spirit world. What did he say? Open up. Open your ears, open your eyes, and let your jaw dropped. Intercession is what empowers angels, recruit other angels, and strengthen angels to win. To win the battle in the spirit world. What did he say, Ethel? Let me say it again. Come on, Martha, open up your ears right now. Come on, Myrtle, open up your ears right now. Intercession is what empowers angels, recruiting of other angels, and strengthen angels to win the battle in the spirit world. You want Bible? All right. Let's look at Psalms 103. Psalms 103, please. Glory to God. <clears throat> Look in your Bible, please. Psalms 103. Thank you, my Father. Come on, say thank you, my Father. Glory be to God. We're going to read verse 20. We're going to read verse 20. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Can you say thank you, Lord Jesus? All right, now, <clears throat> let's read Verse 20. Bless the Lord, you his angels, that excel in strength, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice, the voice, the voice, the voice, the voice of his word. Did you hear that? The voice of his word. So angels excel in strength. They gather in strength. They increase in strength. They are fortified when they hearken, when they hear the voicing of the word. The more you voice, the more you pray the word, the more you pray, the more you pray, the more you're strengthening your angel. Are you listening? The more you're equipping them. You are empowering them, and then you recruit other angels. What? Bible? Let's go to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. You remember that Daniel was fasting and praying? Right? But his prayer was being obstructed. Look at verse 10. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto you and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. Okay, now look at this now. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words or thy prayers. Thy words, what? Thy prayers were heard. And I am come for your words or because of your word. But the prince 
of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. That's what I said to you. Intercession is what empowers angels, recruit other angels. Daniel kept sticking with his prayer. Didn't budge, didn't change. See, some of you, you don't understand the power of sticking with prayer. Are you listening? Sticking with it. Staying with the prayer. Well, I didn't see anything. Daniel took him 21 days. Do you realize when Moses went to fast on 40 days? The Bible says on the seventh day, God spoke to him. My, my, my. Six days he heard nothing. If that was many of us, man, I've been fasting for three days. I, I should hear God. But not, he didn't hear God. Are you listening? Until the seventh day. Are you listening to me now? Many of us, we don't have that stickability. Are you listening? All right, so the, so you notice now, when he kept sticking with his prayer, then Michael came and assist. Michael came and assist. So that's why I'm saying to you, secret number five, I'm looking at my time, intercession is what empowers angels. They, are, they excel in strength, hearkening to the voice of the word. When you are praying, the word, when you're praying in the spirit, you are empowering, you're giving them ammunitions, ammunition to deal uh, with the, uh, to counteract the demons in the spirit realm that are receiving ammunition from witches and warlocks. Are you listening to me now? Witches and warlocks have more of a prayer life than a lot of pastors. Did you hear what I said to you? Witches and warlocks have more of a prayer life than a lot of pastors. It is said that the, what is that, the Barna Research? The Barna Research says the average uh, pastors, listen to this now, the average pastors pray three minutes a day. Less than three minutes a day. Most don't even pray. Most do not even pray. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why our country is in a mess, our churches are in a mess, our families are in a mess, because we're not praying and interceding. Yeah, that's right. Three minutes, my, my, my. My, my, my. And you know why people don't like work, don't like to pray? You know why people don't like to pray? <laughs> McGill says one minute for each meal, three minutes. <laughs> That's about right, Bill. That's about right. That's in America. That's in Europe. Okay. The average pastor pray three minutes. My, my, my. Now, so can you see now how prayer is the empowering of angels, recruiting other angels, and strengthening angels to win the battle in the spirit world? Now, <clears throat> you know why people don't like to pray? Because prayer is work. Ladies and gentlemen, prayer is work. See, you get to sit down in your comfy chair, in your, um, what do you call them chairs now? My mind's come blank. In your lazy boy. All right? And lean back and begin to pray. Did you know for Abraham to pray, it was hard work because he had to go and build an altar. After building an altar, then get a blood sacrifice. Are you listening? It was work, people. By the time he finished building the altar and get that sacrifice done, he'll be wore out and tired. And then he prayed. Then he could bring his supplication before God. There'll be the altar, the sacrifice, and the fire. Say that with me. The what? Building the altar. All right. The altar, the sacrifice, and the fire. 
Well, sometimes intercession feel like work. Sometimes intercession feel like work because you're building an altar. Sometimes intercession feel like a sacrifice. Sometimes it just feels like fire. But in which way, you need all three of them. <laughs> that is correct, Miss Bonnie. We're praying in the lazy boy, sleeping in the lazy boy. No praying in the lazy boy. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I hope you got that. I hope you got that about that altar, sacrifice, fire. And that's how prayer feels like sometimes. Feels like work. Feels like a sacrifice. Feels like a fire. It's not always fire. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it's altar. Sometimes it's sacrifice. Are you listening to me now? This is why. I mean, like yesterday. Yesterday I was like, oh my God, do I have to wake up again in the morning? Do I have to? I went to bed about 3 o'clock. I said, uh, do I have to get up again at 5.55 a.m. to go and get rid of a prayer for 6 a.m.? He said, and I said to Rosie, do we have to do it because it's the festive, festive season? I thought, you know what? No, 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 no. We're going to stick with our prayer. We're going to stick with our prayer. Yes, sometimes it feels like altar building. Yes, sometimes it feels like sacrifice. And yes, sometimes it feels like the fire. But we want, you can't get to the fire until you have the altar building, until you have the sacrifice. My time is running out quickly, please. Intercession is intervention. Intercession, secret number six, intercession is intervention. It is the averting of judgment. It is the averting of judgment. Okay, Ezekiel 22, verse 29. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and the needy. Yea, they have oppressed a stranger wrongfully. But I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy, but I found none. Therefore, I poured out my indignation. Well, are you listening? So, intercession is intervention. It is averting of judgment. Because of time, real quickly, please. Secret number seven. Intercession is true power with God. Intercession is authority and power with God. With God. With God. Never mind dominating the world. I'm talking about you need to have authority and power with God, like Moses did, like Elijah did. Are you listening to me now? Like James camel knees did, like Paul had power and authority with God. That is what intercession gives you. It gives you power and authority with God. God, you can't do this. You can't do this. Genesis chapter 32, chapter 32, verse 24, please. Thank you, Lord. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. <clears throat> and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. You notice that? He wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? He said, my name is Jacob. He said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, which means a prince ruling with God. For as a prince, you now have power with God and with man. you got to have power with God to have power with man, and you have prevailed. In accessory prayer is power with God. See, a lot of people have a prayer life. Uh, a lot of people can say a prayer, but they don't have a prayer life. A lot of people can what? Say a prayer, but they do not have a prayer life. What's the difference? I'll explain that next week to you. <laughs> okay. All right. Secret number eight, quickly, please. What is intercession? Secret number eight, intercession is outlasting the enemy. It is not giving him the last word or the last touch. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Faith Lift Radio Podcast. For more information about Dr. Glenn and how to offer your financial support, log on to glennarecchion.org. 